Thank you, Chrissy. Good morning, everyone, and happy holidays. Thank you for sharing part of your Thursday morning with us. Uh, we have some extraordinary material to talk to you about. If you think about back in September, there was about a six or eight page framework, sort of an outline for tax reform that was produced by the uh, administration. And here we are just a few short months later uh, in legislative years, and we have a 500 page uh, bill that is all but signed. Uh, and 500 pages of conference and committee reports to go with it. So we are going to um, work our way through the materials here. Unfortunately, we cannot cover everything that's in the bill. There's just too much. And even with that, this may feel like a whirlwind as we work through. Uh, but hang with us for the ride, and hopefully we will hit things that are important to you, important to your business, uh, important to your investors, important to your vendors, important to your employees, important to your customers. So somewhere in here, uh, we will find something that applies to you and others. I'm joined today by, by my colleagues uh, who are partners and directors in our firm. They are the leaders of our specialty tax services. Uh, we have only had this material really for less than a week, and even then there were some changes going on this week. So uh, we are still digesting what all of this means, but we'll give you examples, talk to you about things that may need to take place before the end of this year in these last few days, and some things to think about clearly as we start 2018. As always, be, uh, be assured this is an overview. This is not the specifics of any particular provision. Uh, and as guidance comes out, as more information comes out, we will be back to you with more materials. But uh, please, without uh, more further delving into the, the rules and requirements, uh, this is an overview. All right, with that, uh, we have so much material to get to go. Let's go ahead and get started. And Mike Kirkman is going to talk to us about what is new in the law for individuals, estates, and trusts. Mike? Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, welcome, everybody, here. Uh, let me just say that as uh, if you generate questions, which I'm sure there will be, uh, feel free to reach out to me via email uh, through mkirkman at cbh.com. Uh, I may not have all the answers, but uh, I have studied this pretty extensively. Uh, the first section relating to individual income tax that's affecting everybody that's on this call. There's no question about this. And I, this is just an illustration. I'm sure everybody's heard through the news with the change in the rates. And we started with maybe having four rates to we're still at seven rates. But there's a pretty substantial uh, drop in the, in the rates, uh, especially on the, on the top end. The, the various brackets, and this is just an illustration of married, file, and joint, just to give you a flavor of when the top rates kick in and the different levels. So you can see here, for instance, that someone that's making under 315,000 but above 165,000 is going to be in the 24% bracket range. Just to highlight where these top brackets kick in, uh, the 37% uh, hits for these various filing levels. So you can see they've, they've ratcheted it up pretty good. But the one thing that's in the, the new law is there's no phase out for the lower brackets. And what I mean by that is typically in the past, uh, if you reach a certain income level, uh, then the lower bracket benefits, the lower uh, rates get phased out. So effectively, it makes you taxed at a much higher rate. There's no phase in for the lower brackets. In the, the estate and trust area, uh, if anybody has a, a trust or has worked through an estate from an income tax perspective, they are always been in a higher tax bracket. And what I mean by that is not just that there's only four rates that are being proposed, is that the top income level, or, or at a lower income level, the top rate hits. So for instance, the 37% for a married filing joint hits at around $600,000 or over $600,000. For an estate or trust from an income tax standpoint, it hits at 12.5. This is really not a change other than by the rate structure that's happening. The, the trust and estates have always been taxed at a pretty significant level. And uh, the, the personal exemption, very similar to the individual, has been suspended or, or repealed, whichever word you want to use. Uh, standard deduction, uh, it's gotten a lot of press. Uh, effectively, it's doubled. Uh, and the personal exemptions have been suspended. 
the capital gain tax rate uh, did not change. Uh, the one uh, change that did occur was the threshold break points that each bracket 0, 15, and 20 percent is going to be indexed for inflation going forward, which is, is, which is a good thing. Uh, repeal, you hear me say repeal suspended. Uh, what I mean by that is when we get to 2026, uh, these are going to revert back into play. Uh, now, that's a long time, and as everybody knows, law, law does change, and Congress changes, and the administration changes, so who knows what will really happen. But as of January 1, these are the various items that have no application. Uh, and let me just point out a couple significant ones. Uh, the, the moving and re reimbursement expense is, uh, is going away, but it does not impact uh, active duty service members. Uh, the alimony uh, deduction and income inclusion has been delayed. Initially, it was thought to, it was going to be suspended as of January 1 of 2018, but it's being delayed to 2019. Uh, but all these other items that do add up uh, are going away. The medical expenses are going to maintain for one more year at 7.5% threshold of your AGI. So that got kicked in just for one more year, but in 2019, that will be uh, lost as far as the standard or itemized deduction. Probably two of the significant items that's gotten quite a bit of attention is the home mortgage deduction. It's now being capped uh, if it is uh, acquisition indebtedness of 750000 and if you have a contract or there's a purchase that's occurred before December the 15th of 2017, the limit is a million. This, this limitation uh, of 750 or a million does apply to second homes as well, as long as it's acquisition indebtedness. Probably the big change is that if you have home equity indebtedness that's not related to the purchase of your home, uh, the original purchase of your home, that deduction is lost starting next year. The state and local tax, uh, there was so much press, there's still so much press about this. Uh, they included uh, a cap for individuals, non-trader business of $10,000. That includes your real estate taxes, your state and local taxes. But if you have a Schedule C or any type of business, rental property, those kind of things, the, the interest or the state tax, uh, the real estate tax related to that is fully allowable. Of course, everybody wants to know a strategy of how to get more deductions into this year as opposed to uh, uh, losing it next year. And there's a specific provision uh, in the new law that, that restricts the prepayment of a future tax uh, into pushing it into uh, the deduction for 2017. Now, that provision is only, at least in the law, is only applying to state and local taxes. Charitable contribution change, we went from a 50% cash limit on the AGI to 60% that allows a higher deduction uh, depending on contribution levels. Uh, the five-year carryover is remaining in place and probably the one that's going to affect a lot of the, the, the sports enthusiasts is the deduction of the 80% cost of, de of tickets that are provided through donations to uh, a university or an organization. The one thing about the charitable deduction as far as the itemized deduction limitations is a lot there's a lot of thought into if, if you do make significant gifts periodically to, to potentially either do that before the end of the year through either a donor advised fund or directly to your charity uh, as opposed to doing little amounts each year because uh, depending on what your itemized deductions look like you may not reach the threshold of the 24,000 or the single threshold One thing I'll mention here, and there was one change at the last minute when uh, the House was uh, voting on this a couple days ago, is in the 529 plans. It's now including uh, the allowing the distributions from 529s to pay for elementary and high school expenses. Uh, originally in the bill, homeschooling was included at the last minute that got pulled, uh, but the limit is 10,000 per year. And you can have unborn children as a designated beneficiary as well. 
probably a significant change that's uh, hopefully going to allow not as many people to be affected by a the dreaded AMT is the exemptions. Uh, when AMT was put into place many years ago, there was not a provision that tied in the exemption and the threshold phase-out amounts to inflation. So uh, we were locked in at uh, 40,000 exemption and a phase-out at around 150,000. Those amounts have been increased uh, quite significantly. It will uh, still impact uh, individuals, but hopefully not as bad. And these thresholds are just for married, filing, and joint. The kitty tax has gotten a little bit simpler. Uh, the, the rates that are going to apply on the kitty tax level are the ones that uh, apply to estates and trusts. So hopefully that, that calculation will not be as complicated moving forward. So what's some things that did not change? Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of the key ones here. Uh, the capital gains on the sale of your personal residence. There was a lot of talk that that was going to be included in there and that that we were going to, uh, the, the old law of you've got a half a million dollars of gain that can be excluded from the sale of your personal residence, that maintained in place. Uh, the other big one was the talk about removing the specific identification of stock sales uh, or lots of stock that are sold uh, and moving to a complete FIFO basis, which would capture a lot of low basis stock and include uh, a much higher gain. Uh, that change did not uh, occur, which is a good thing for investors. Business income that relates to individuals and, tr and trust in the states that have investments in qualified business income, there is a 20% uh, deduction. There's a lot of limitations and thresh thresholds to go to. I'm going to defer that to Sarah's presentation, which will be next, and she's going to cover a couple examples. But the key point here is that while she may be focusing in on partnerships and uh, separate entities for individuals that have Schedule Cs or trust in the states that have investments in these type of qualified business uh, entities, th this deduction will apply to those. Electing small business trust, essentially what that is is an S-corp that's owned in a trust and the trust makes an election uh, to qualify and not lose the S-election to qualify the, the, uh, as a S-corp shareholder. And an electing small business trust typically has uh, multiple beneficiaries. Uh, the current law does not allow a non-resident of the U.S. to be a current beneficiary of this trust. The rules are going to change next year to uh, open that up where you can have U.S. non-residents as, as uh, beneficiaries of an ESBT. And the charitable reduction rules uh, have been changed to uh, be based more on the individual tax rules. Uh, as opposed to the trust rules, which are far more restrictive for ESBTs. And I'm sure everybody's heard about this uh, large increase here. The current exemption amount uh, right now is $5.49 million uh, for a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident. When they die, everybody has this exemption. If they don't use it during their life at their death, uh, you can pass that much free of a state gift and generation skipping tax. Uh, that exemption has been moved uh, up to, starting next year, $11,200,000. So a joint couple's got basically $22 million of room to maneuver. And so there's a lot of opportunity out there that, to plan for folks that have used a lot of their exemption amount uh, in the future. The rate uh, that was thought to be dropped to 35%, it remains unchanged. And the, the, the asset bump up to fair, fair market value at date of death also remains in place. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sarah, and she's going to talk about pass-through businesses. Okay, Mike, before we finish, we've got a couple of questions that have come in uh, asking about um, uh, state income taxes and, and uh, property taxes and what are the sort of the guidelines for paying those um, uh, in advance. Uh, the um, uh, the bill came out and had some specific guidelines about not paying for 2018 taxes, income taxes. Uh, but there are some general rules about paying property taxes that have always been in place um, about uh, you know when is the assessment and uh, has the assessment occurred and and paying those paying those amounts. Um, we'd strongly recommend people talk with their advisors. 
De definitely. It, they, they specifically just, I think if there is an assessment and there's something that's due within 1231 of uh, this year, uh, clearly the payment of that can be a uh, deduction in this year. But uh, again, the, the, in the law, they were speculating that folks would try to lump in. Uh, and a lot of the, of the jurisdictions don't even accept a prepayment. Um, but uh, the, the, the statute, the, the way it's written, indicates that if, if a tax relates to a subsequent period and not the current period, that uh, the deduction would not be allowable. Great. All right. Well, let's move on uh, and get to talking about pass-through businesses, because this is where there have been some pretty dramatic changes. So during this time period, I'm going to talk about uh, the new uh, Section 199A. That's that 20% deduction folks hear about. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the excess business loss limitation and give an example for that, the interest expense limitations that come up, and those apply across the board, all business uh, activities, um, and a few other new partnership provisions or clarifications that uh, uh, fit our pass-through entities. So first off, the one thing that everybody has questions about is this new Section 199A, that's the 20% deduction of combined qualified business income from pass-through entities. Uh, qualified business income then has sort of a separate test. You've got to look at each separate uh, pass-through business, uh, sole proprietorship, state trusts, uh, partnerships, S-corporations, um, uh, REITs, and uh, publicly traded partnerships and see what that income is and run some more tests to determine it's not always just a flat 20% of taxable income that affects what's going to happen. But you take the, uh, to figure that combined qualified business income, you first have to look at each entity, take 20% of its business income, compare that against either 50% of W-2 wages or 25% of W-2 wages plus a uh, two and a half percent of the cost of tangible depreciable property. Uh, take the lesser of those. Add that to qualified 20% of qualified REIT dividends and qualified uh, publicly traded partnership income. And then there's a final test against uh, overall taxable income of the taxpayer. <clears throat> there are limitations out there of, on, on the, wage, the wages. There are exclusions of what kind of businesses may not qualify for this deduction. And there are thresholds for uh, eliminating or phasing out both those caps and exclusions. So with that big picture behind us, I think it'll be easier if we walk through an example. So here is a, an example based on one that is in the Senate uh, conference report, the Senate Amendment Conference Report. Uh, it's tweaked a little bit and changed up. But here we've got a husband who's invested in a partnership and uh, a wife who has a Schedule C business. And then they are both jointly invested in a REIT that receives some qualified dividends. Overall, their income for the year is $310,000, taxable income. And within that $310,000 is $15,000 worth of net capital gains. So the first test, let's go back up to the partnership interest. Uh, we have his share, the partner's share of the, of the qualified business income, $250,000. We multiply that times. 20% uh, to get $50,000. That's, that's, our, that's our first preliminary deduction number. Uh, then we do the other two tests. We say, okay, well, how much W-2 wages were paid by the partnership that are allocable to this partner? And the answer to that is $80,000 times 50% leaves uh, 40000 That's That's another piece of information. Then we take that same W-2 wages times 25% and add to it the share of the tangible property cost uh, from the partnership allocable to this partner. So if this is, a say, a manufacturing uh, concern uh, where they have a lot invested in the machinery and equipment, say there's a million dollars allocated to this partner of capital. So 2.5% of that is 25000 So our first test then is to take the greater of either 50% of the wages or the combined uh, wages and capital percentages. And in this case, it turns out to be the wages and capital is our better answer. So we compare that $45,000 number against the 40 and choose the 45. Then we compare that limitation against 
20% of the uh, total income, so with the 50,000 versus the 45, take the lesser of that, gives us our preliminary number of $45,000. That's the qualified business uh, income for that uh, activity. Then we go down to the, uh, the, the wife's Schedule C business, and this happens to be, say, a law firm. So there's not a lot of capital to it. Uh, she just has one employee that she uses. So $150,000 of uh, the qualified business income, turns out that happens to be, as we work through the numbers, uh, the, the portion that actually gets, gets through test one and test two to become the qualified business income for that activity. Now, this happens to be you know, a law practice, specified service business, but because their total taxable income of 310,000 is less than the threshold set of 315, she is allowed to use uh, this deduction for that income. They also have some qualified REIT dividends. We get 20% of that $10,000 is two, so that comes across. So now we have the combined qualified business income. That's the, the portion from the partnership, portion from the Schedule C business, and also the qualified REIT dividends to give us a total of $77,000. Then we get to the last test, which is, OK, compare that number against overall income and taxable income. Uh, less capital gains is 295,000 times 20 percent is 59,000. So we have to take the lesser of those two numbers, the total qualified business income and the 59,000 test of, of current taxable income gives us our net 199A deduction of $59,000. So it's a rather complicated process. And as you can see, you're going to need uh, each individual partner uh, or S corporation shareholder or beneficiary of a trust or an estate is going to need a lot of information from the partnership in order to be able to, or from the pass-through entity, in order to be able to calculate this test. Let's, let's walk through one more example, slightly different. This time, let's assume that the partnership interest threw off a $100,000 loss rather than income. Well, certainly the wages and, and uh, capital percentages are still going to give us uh, a positive qualified business income. But remember, we take the lesser of them, so uh, we are out with a $20,000 uh, qualified business loss from the partnership activity. In this example, we've also assumed, if you look at the, the bottom left, that their taxable income exceeds the $315,000 threshold. So they are now in the phase out section that applies to the wife's specified service business. So she is no longer eligible to take the full 20% deduction against her qualified business income or against wages. Uh, and so there's a limitation on how much she is allowed. So because of the, the, the phase out of, of her uh, business income, this deduction allowable for her business, um, this time she's only going to get $12,000 in qualified business income. So when we combine the uh, now the, and the qualified REIT dividend, that's still out there just fine. When we combine the the partnership loss with the Schedule C income, the twenty thousand dollar loss with the twelve thousand dollar income to get to our combined qualified business income, we wind up with a negative eight thousand dollars. We combine compare that against the qualified REIT dividend of two thousand. Well, we have a net six thousand dollar qualified business income loss for the year. So clearly, that's going to be less than any taxable income limitation. So there's no deduction for this year. And as a matter of fact, that $6,000 of net loss is going to be carried over and applied against the calculations uh, in the 2019 test. So um, quite a complicated set of rules, new sets of carry forward information. These are very simplified calculations. I just want you to get a flavor for what this new rule looks like and the kinds of testing that's going to need to go on for here. A couple of key points here. Um, qualified business, business income must be effectively connected with a trader business within the US. It's, it's got to be a domestic business activity. Investment income is not, a, is not considered, so if you have a, if a pass through entity has a portfolio account, has an investment fund, uh, all of that income, even if it's throwing off large amounts of income, that will be excluded from this calculation. Uh, and 
when you're looking at the individual's return, even though, say, that S corporation shareholder received W-2 income from this business or the partner received guaranteed payments from this business, those are not added into this calculation. They, they do not get included in determining the qualified business income. So that stays over um, separate. And this is just, uh, say, the activity that's on <clears throat> your Schedule a, uh, C or Schedule E pass-through uh, activities. So what is a specified service trader business? Well, it includes health, law, consulting, athletics, uh, financial services, brokerage services, investing, trading, investment management. Uh, or there's a catch-all phrase here that says, where the principal asset is the reputation of, or skill of one or more of its employees or owners. So that might also include um, 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 professional artists uh, and um, musicians. Um, and, and those like that, specifically excluded. This was an interesting thing that came out of the conference report. But specifically excluded is engineering and architecture services. Those uh, escaped the definition of a specified trade or business, so they don't have to worry about income levels or phase outs um, for those activities. So a couple of key points. The deduction is determined by shareholders and partners in Schedule C uh, uh, activity. You're going to need information from those partnerships to help with this information. The deduction is available to trust and estates. Uh, and it is, it is a deduction from taxable income. So it's not against um, adjusted gross income. It's not a Schedule A itemized deduction. This is going to come uh, right before you figure out what your taxable income is. If you think about your Form 1040, it would be on, say, page 2 of your Form 1040 after you've taken out your standard deduction or itemized deduction. Then you would take out this amount as well. One good, good piece of information, since uh, alternative minimum tax is retained for individuals, there are no AMT adjustments that have to be made to this number. So fortunately, we only have to calculate it once. Uh, only applies to income, not to self-employment tax. So uh, this is not going to be a deduction that helps to reduce our self-employment income and reduce that tax. This is only applies to income. And like I said, you will be carrying over a negative uh, qualified big business income amount to the next year, and it will affect the next year's deduction. So we do have still some open questions. The uh, IRS has been, uh, uh, Treasury has been uh, given authority to uh, address tiered entities. So if you have uh, a series of partnerships that flow through, how will that apply? Or even with S corporations, where there is an estate that has a, an ownership interest, and you might have some flow through from an S corporation. So we still are looking for that. Um, what happens with a short tax year? Uh, what about sales of business in the mid of the year? If you're, if you're selling out all of your assets, how is that going to be counted? What about empl leased employees? Will they be able to be counted as part of that W-2 income uh, limitation in that test? Uh, allocating those W-2 income to partner with capital accounts, the, the tangible property, there's some guidelines that are that's in the um, law but uh, or in the bill, but we'll need to get some guidance. And uh, what happens when this expires after 2025? This is a temporary position. So uh, in thinking about restructuring your organization or thinking of changing your organization, you have to remember that right now this is, this is a temporary deduction and a temporary set of rules. Uh, who wins in here? Well, individuals who own partnership or S corporations where their, ta where their taxable income is less than the amount of the limitation. Uh, they don't have to worry about any of the, any of the other rules. They're going to get the nice deductions eligible uh, out of this 199A. Architects and engineers, of course, um, and estates and trusts, because they were not originally permitted, but in the conference bill they were wrapped in and included. Uh, like I say, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, partnerships that, that don't pay W-2 wages are going to be disadvantaged. Uh, those pass through businesses that generate zero income or uh, are maybe disadvantaged. And there's still some rules that we're going to need to follow up on. OK, let's move on to another, another nice surprise for everyone. This is the excess business loss limitation for non-corporate taxpayers. 
So basically saying, you know, once you get through the passive activity loss rules and uh, that, we're not going to let you take more than a certain amount in a particular year. So they're sort of putting the brakes on uh, taking in deductions in a particular tax year. So uh, the limitation is uh, business income gains and, and business gains plus uh, either 500,000 if you're filing a married filing jointly or 250,000 if you're file, uh, filing singly. And again, this is all applied at the partner or shareholder level, not at the entity itself. And this is after you've already run through all the basis limitations, the passive activity loss limitations, and now you have this uh, uh, third limitation or fourth limitation that you may have. So in the example I have on the right, you've got a couple that has uh, you know, 250,000 of compensation income, interest and dividends of 20,000, retirement income, say, of 150, um, some Schedule C income of 15,000, and then a large Schedule E loss. Maybe, maybe it was a passive loss free up that happened uh, this year, and then some uh, itemized deductions of 30,000. Well, that $750,000 loss, uh, we have to test that and see if it's all allowed. So we look to see what other what other business income is out there? Well, we have the Schedule C business income of 15000 and we get our, our base amount. In this case, it's uh, 500000 for a married filing jointly couple. So the most loss that will be allowed would be 515000 Well, we've got 750000 flowing through, so we're going to have to limit that loss uh, by 235000 that excess amount. And so uh, before this limitation, their taxable income would have been a loss of 345. We take out that excess loss, which is going to limit their taxable income for this year to only 110,000. So what happens to that excess loss? Well, it's carried forward like in the form of a net operating loss. So it does become available in the very next tax year to apply against income because uh, it's treated as, as a net operating loss. But uh, then there's there's as you'll hear, there are limitations on net operating losses as well. So it's really a, a putting the brakes on a bit, tapping the brakes to slow down the deduction in uh, this current year when the loss occurs, and spreading that out over the next couple of years. Not a particularly exciting result for taxpayers experiencing that loss. Limitation on business ex interest expense. This is another limitation that's happening. Um, 30% of adjusted taxable income plus any business interest income that's out there. Um, this is going to apply uh, at the partnership level, at the S corporation level, and pass through down to uh, the partners and, and shareholders. There's a whole other set of rules for partners in partnerships um, that may free up some additional uh, interest expense that could flow through. The disallowed interest is carried forward indefinitely. And the idea really here is to sort of uh, give people pause in thinking about, well, should we make debt investments or equity investments if we're going to have this uh, interest expense limitation? So 30% of income is the uh, limitation for how much uh, interest expense could be deducted in a particular year. There are a couple exceptions. Small businesses uh, with gross receipts less than $25 million, this does not apply to. Also, regulated public utilities and electric cooperatives are, are ex also uh, accepted from these rules. Floor plan financing for motor vehicles, uh, that also is exempt from these rules. And finally, for real property, trades or businesses, and farming, if those entities choose a longer depreciation life, that's that alternative depreciation system, then they too may be exempt from this limitation on uh, interest expense. Uh, in my last couple of minutes here, just want to hit on a couple of things. Uh, the, um, there was a provision put in relating to sales of partnership interest by foreign investors. Um, essentially, it codified Revenue Ruling 9132 and said that if you, there is a gain on sale of the partnership, it will be treated as effectively connected with a US trader business to the extent that if the partnership had sold the assets, it would have allocated uh, effectively connected income to that foreign investor. It coordinates with the FERPTA rules, the Foreign uh, Investment and Real Property Tax Act rules, and there is a 10% withholding uh, on the amount realized requirement as well. 
carried interests. Uh, this finally got settled. Uh, carried interests now require three-year holding period to achieve long-term capital gain status. Otherwise, they will uh, retain short-term capital gain status. Um, Built-in loss rules for partnership transfers, that's just expanded the required recognition of losses. Technical terminations were repealed. That is the, the um, act that forced a partnership to end and start over when there was a greater than 50% ownership change. And a couple of other basis rules dealing with contributions of appreciated property and foreign tax credits. Mike already mentioned about electing small business op trust opportunity for new kinds of investors there. Uh, and finally, for those that are interested in converting from S corporation to C corporation, there are some special rules that apply if, it's, if the conversion is connected with this bill enactment um, and how any future distributions are treated to come out of both the S corporation accumulated earnings and out of um, C corporation earnings and profits that would affect how those items are taxed. Lots of interesting things happening here in the pass-through world, uh, and uh, stay tuned for more information. But let's go to uh, Barry Wines, who's going to tell us how to rethink about our C corporations. Barry? Good morning, everyone. So we're going to talk about C corporations. Believe it or not, there's not a whole lot specifically with C corps other than the big one, which is they reduce the overall rate to a flat 21%. So now C-Corps will pay 21% tax rate on dollar one up to whatever they have. So there are no brackets in the C-Corp world like there used to be or equivalent in the individual. Also personal service corporations, which are generally those that are run by lawyers, accountants, uh, architects, things along those lines. They had a higher tax rate overall. They did not benefit from the brackets. They are now at 21% as well. Corporate AMT is completely eliminated. So there, are no, there is no more corporate AMT. Unlike the, the individual AMT, the corporate AMT is a permanent elimination. Now, a lot of companies may have paid AMT in the past, and therefore they have credits. So what the, what the provisions say is that the AMT credits can be used to offset 100% of the tax. In the years 2018 through 2020, if you have credits that are greater than your tax, you can get a refund for half of those credits in excess of your tax. And that will continue through 2020. And in 2021, to the extent you have still have credits, in excess of your tax that haven't already been re refunded, 100% of that would be refunded. So the government, in essence, instead of, of paying out all that money now or making you carry it forward, they're going to pay it out over time, just a little bit e easier on the budget. So what other changes do we have? Well, C corporations can now use the cash method of accounting if the gross receipts is now $25 million. It used to be five, so it's, it's significantly expanded. This is why C-Corps are now a little bit more attractive as potential um, entity choices. The other big change, it doesn't necessarily apply just to C-Corps, but it probably has a big impact on your entity selection, is if you create patents or the words they use, an invention model or design, or secret formula or process. Generally, if you sold those, then that gain was a capital gain. So at the individual, it would be taxed at the favorable capital gains rate. In the corporation, it would just be taxed at normal corporate rates. Well, that now is considered ordinary income, which means at the individual rates, you could pay tax on, at a rate of up to 37%, yet in the C-Corp, it's now a 21% rate. So again, those are things that may have an impact on entity selection. The repeal of the 199 deduction, that was for manufacturers. If you were doing manufacturing here in the US, then, then that deduction was available. That was a deduction that didn't really have a cash outlay, sort of like the deduction that Sarah just went through on pastors. Uh, this, this one was 199. The new one is 199 cap A. The other thing, just to remember, even though it's not here, 
Is the 30% business interest that was discussed by Sarah, the limitation, that also applies to C-Corps. The other really big change in the C-Corp world is they changed NOLs. So if you have an NOL in 2017 or prior, they may be carried back two years, and then there's a 20-year carry forward. If you do not use that NOL within 20 years, you lose it. And those NOLs can be used to offset up to 100% of your taxable income. So if I had a loss in the prior year and income in the current year, I can use my NOL up to 100% of my income so I wouldn't pay tax. But going forward, losses incurred in 2018 and forward, there are some changes. There is no carryback. So if you, incur, if you pay tax in one year and incur a loss in another year, you'll not have the opportunity to go back and claim that tax. The second thing is unlimited carry forward. So the 20-year timetable is off, off the table. It's, it's available whenever you can use it. The other big change they made is in the year that you use those losses, and these are the post-2017 losses, you can only offset 80% of your income. So if I've got a million dollars of income, I have a million dollars of loss from the prior year, I can only offset 80% of that million dollars, which means I'm going to pay tax, the 21%, on 20% of that, the, on the 200000 So you will have a tax liability if I lose, this, the, lose the same amount that I made in the following year, you're not going to be able to fully offset that. So those are really the big changes with C Corp. So now we're going to move on to uh, credits and accounting methods with Ron Wainwright. Thanks, Barry. And again, I want to thank everyone for uh, taking time out of their schedules to spend with us today on, as Sarah highlighted, um, you know, really a total recodification of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, so to speak, 31 years in the making since the Tax Reform Act of, of 1986. Uh, so in the, the time we have together, we're only going to be able to hit the highlights. And so I'm going to walk through the following agenda today, um, kind of following on some comments Barry made in regards to cash method uh, accounting and the increase there. Those are really called the small business provisions. We'll talk a little bit about what we saw and see in cost recovery. Um, talk about deductions and credits that clearly were repealed. Conference agreement on federal credits that were modified. Uh, the continuation of the energy credits, and then two very specific areas of tax planning to take into consideration now through 1231-17 uh, and then into uh, the 2018 year. So, so let's get started on the, the accounting method side. So if you really look at the conference agreement, it includes a number of provisions to basically reform and simplify small business accounting methods. All of these provisions would be effective for tax years beginning after December 31, 2017. Um, basically, these provisions allow businesses greater access to the cash method of accounting and clearly expand some of the exceptions to the requirements specifically towards inventory, the unicap rules, and ultimately uh, long-term or completed contract uh, rules. Um, so let's start with the cash method of accounting. I think we all know that under the current law, with certain exceptions, uh, C corporation or partnership with a C corporation partner can use the cash method of accounting um, if each of the prior tax year's annual gross receipts did not exceed the, uh, the $5 million mark. Much discussion in the House and the Senate and the conference ultimately decided to increase uh, to $25 million. There are still some exceptions there. I would indicate the $25 million is indexed for inflation for tax years beginning after 2018. Uh, very important to note that this change to or from uh, the cash method of accounting uh, as a result of this provision would be treated as a voluntary change, in essence a automatic change in the taxpayer's method of accounting, uh, but subject to, of course, uh, what we refer to as the 481A adjustment. Uh, so moving to inventories, uh, same concept around the current law has special rules in there with respect to the accrual method of accounting when we have inventories. 
Uh, again, much discussion. This is really framed underneath some of the simplicity in the Act. But ultimately, the conference agreement would allow additional businesses with inventories uh, to use the cash method by increasing this threshold to $25 million. Uh, similar to the uh, cash method uh, comment, a change to or from would result uh, basically in a voluntary change or an automatic change um, in the taxpayer's method of accounting, again, subject to the, the 481A adjustment. So, so some simplification there. Um, much debate over the 15 to 25 million. And as you can see uh, in conference, we landed on the $25 million. Um, so kind of uh, continuing on, I did address the uh, UNICAP piece in there as well. But remember that under the current law, a business with 10 million or less of gross receipts uh, for the prior three years uh, is not subject to the uniform capitalization or what's referred to as the 263 CAFE rules with respect to uh, their basically their inventories. But under the conference agreement, producers or resellers now with average gross receipts of 25 million or, or less, uh, again, would be fully exempt uh, from the UNICAP rules, um, from the uh, same comment around a change in this treatment under the 263 cap A cost uh, would be treated as a voluntary change, in essence, a, an automatic change in accounting method, again, subject uh, to the 481A adjustments. And then uh, the last item in regards to really you know, accounting method changes for small businesses falls into the increase in the exception for accounting for long-term contracts. Uh, as a reminder, under the current law, uh, the taxable income from a long-term contract generally uh, is determined under the percentage of completion method. Um, there are exceptions to this requirement, um, basically the $10 million threshold. And then as we saw in the conference agreement, the $10 million average annual gross receipts exception to the percentage of completion method would be increased to $25 million. Um, so again, the provision, the provision would apply to contracts entered into after December 31st of 2017 um, in that date. So the, you know, some simplification there actually in the tax reform. Um, moving on to cost recovery, where we saw a significant change. Of course, everyone is focused on the ability under now 168K. That's the prior uh, bonus uh, provisions. Uh, as you can see on the slide in conference, uh, they uh, leaned uh, to the Senate uh, provisions, which basically now call for very similar to the House, I would point out, 100% expensing for any assets of class lives of 20 years or less. Um, you uh, are allowed to immediately expense. Um, and that uh, begins September 28th of 2017. Uh, so there's some planning opportunities there as we go into 2000 uh, year in plan, 2017 year in planning. I would point out, as they leaned into the Senate, um, remember that this is uh, effective uh, for years after December 31st of 2000. Uh, 21, we begin, or 22, excuse me, we begin to see a phase down effective January 1, 23 of this provision, uh, 80 going down to 20. And that's not dissimilar to what we were seeing at the 50% level underneath current law. Um, Section 179, again, an opportunity with respect to uh, expensing assets. Uh, the conference bill ultimately came to the Senate side, which basically means that uh, we have a million dollar max as a comparison. We're at a 500,000 max now, where the phase out began at 2 million. So we're now at a million max with the phase out beginning at 2.5. And, and then it does expand the definition of qualified property um, from the uh, Section 179 rules. So uh, certainly some uh, specific opportunities there. When you think about like-kind exchanges uh, and what was brought forth in the uh, tax reform or, or uh, what we uh, assume the name is Tax Cuts Job Act, um, you'll see that now there is a, uh, a limit on the non-recognition of the gain uh, for like-kind exchanges to real property. Um, so personal property uh, is no longer eligible. Um, obviously, that will have implications from our 1031. But recognize that in that account, if we're acquiring a new or used asset, um, which was also the language that came through the conference, you'll be able to expense that, quote, 
asset uh, on personal property side. So you really kind of get to the same point when you think about 1031 like-kind exchanges. Um, ultimately, when we think about cost recovery in the context of depreciation of uh, quote, non-residential real property. So we're talking about, about obviously commercial buildings and, and multi-residential facilities. Uh, the conference came out as the, basically the Senate side of the bill, except for the change where our class lives still stay at 39 and, and 27 and a half year life. Uh, so obviously an evaluation um, with respect to Cost segregation, we'll talk about a little bit about from a planning perspective, is going to be more impactful uh, as we go forward um, towards 168K being the bonus depreciation now at 100%. So a lot of changes there. Sarah did mention uh, briefly in the pass-through side um, some of the specific ADS rules around the uh, uh, basically your limitations, and so that's something to pay attention to from a, a planning perspective on, on cost recovery, if you will. Um, so um, again, just leading a little bit into the limitation on business of interest deductions, um, generally follows the Senate with modifications. Um, and then again, um, there are some adjustments, as I've highlighted here, um, but would point out that if you're using the ADS method and some of the other items that I've mentioned here, there are some adjustments um, that came through uh, that we'll take into consideration on the limitation of that business interest deduction. Um, so something to pay attention to as we go forward uh, from that perspective. So let's talk now about some of the deductions and the credits um, that were to be repealed. Um, in fact, are repealed now if the president signs uh, the legislation. So when you think about local lobbying expenses under 162E, those are no longer uh, a deductible item. Barry already mentioned the domestic production activity deduction. Uh, there was some discussion in conference uh, in regards to holding that until uh, or through 2017, uh, and, and even into 18. Um, excuse me, and then uh, ultimately they uh, repealed that uh, effective for taxable years beginning um, or ending on December 31st, 2017. Uh, employment Achievement Awards exclusions were repealed, and Deb will talk a little bit more about that in detail, uh, but from an accounting method perspective, these statutory provisions are, are no longer in the statute. Uh, again, same concept repealed around a rollover of publicly traded securities and the specific gain with respect to what's referred to as small business investment companies uh, or a provision called 1044 was repealed. Um, Barry mentioned the change in regards to the now uh, special rule and treatment of uh, the sale or exchange of patents. Prior law, of course, was capital in nature of characterization. And now we find ourselves into a, an ordinary ca characterization. Um, last, probably repeal, was the technical termination provisions in the partnership uh, of 708B. That, candidly, was a, a simplification provision uh, within the tax reform. So uh, very specific areas to, to try and simplify um, in certain accounting methods basically being totally repealed, repealed out of the statute. Um, that's, so to speak, the bad news. I would tell you the good news is there were a number of, um, I'll say, credits and, and things moving back and forth in conference. Um, R&D, which was one of the only two credits at the federal level that were called out in a bipartisanship way, uh, is alive and well and within the statute. Uh, some of the amendments that actually would have enhanced the credit unfortunately did not make it through conference, uh, if you're aware of that. So, uh, of course, there was an AMT concern there if the Senate put that in at the last moment. But uh, that being repealed, uh, the R&D credit uh, underneath both the regular method and the ASC method is, is alive and well. Um, so that's clearly an opportunity to, to minimize tax liabilities, uh, not only currently, but on a go-forward basis. Um, there were some changes, um, or thought to be some changes, basically around whether I would need to capitalize my R&D expenditures uh, under 174. Currently, um, those are deemed to be expensed under 174A unless I elect to capitalize them. So that was basically fought back. 
Um, and as we've highlighted here, the amortization basically was the same as the Senate provisions, but most importantly, um, the ability to not expense um, but must capitalize on a go-forward basis is now effective after 12-31-2021. Um, the low-income housing tax credit was the second credit that was named under a bipartisanship agreement, um, or LHITC. So that is, in fact, alive and well. Um, it actually uh, is staying, and it was really not addressed in conference agreement uh, at all. So um, that's a positive. There was much discussion in regards to what's referred to as the, uh, the orphan drug credit um, to basically be uh, reduced or, in fact, limited um, from the standpoint of uh, the 50 percent that it's currently at, moving basically down now uh, to uh, 25 percent. So significant change from House to Senate to, to the conference agreement, um, but ultimately the uh, orphan drug and rare disease credit um, is to say, but again, that there's a limitation um, provided within the, uh, the Senate, which originally was 27 and a half and now has fallen out uh, to 25. So uh, that stays, which was a positive note on the, uh, the, the federal credit side. And then last, you have this, uh, quote, employer credit for paid family, or excuse me, employer provided child care credit. Um, much debate there. Um, ultimately, it was staying and has stayed in this, the, the, uh, the statute um, with respect to child care credit. Um, House was to repeal it. Much debate, ultimately. Uh, the conference agreement did not include uh, the House side, and so that, that federal credit is, is fortunately still alive and well. Um, somewhat continuing on in, in kind of conference agreement on credits, um, those of you who take advantage of what's referred to as the, uh, the rehabilitation credit, um, that was actually called to be repealed, um, but it does stay in the statute. Um, however, there are um, specific uh, limitations, if you will, to the historic rehab credit. Um, ultimately, uh, the credit uh, falls out uh, in a very positive me measure, but there are some transitional rules you're going to want to apply or be very um, aware of. Um, and we don't have the time to, unfortunately, go into those. Um, worker opportunity tax credit, again, was to be repealed. Uh, the good news is, is it stays. It was not included in conference. So the worker opportunity tax credit attributable to hiring certain individuals at a federal level stays in place. Um, there was some discussion around the ability to what do we do with the unused business credits from the standpoint of uh, the ability to, uh, to deduct. The House was going to review, actually repeal, but ultimately uh, in the conference agreement with respect to uh, unused business credits. Um, they did not include the House piece of a repeal. So uh, statute stays the same. Um, new markets tax credit, which ultimately came in underneath the, uh, the PATH Act, uh, about $5.5 billion. Uh, the House actually called uh, for its total repeal, or in essence, no new market credits uh, on a go-forward basis after December 31 of 2017. Uh, the good news is the new market credits, or that $2.5 billion, for real estate developers, et cetera, in those depressed areas is still alive and well, and that program continues. Um, ultimately, the credit for expenditures for, for disabled individuals, again, another federal credit. The House called for it to be repealed, uh, but, um, but fortunately, it, it does stay as they did not take up the uh, provision with respect to uh, the credit for expenditures for disabled individuals. So that's still still in the statute, um, which is a positive event. Um, there were a number of energy credit provisions that we can't do a deep dive into. Um, these relate back to really the Energy Policy Act of 2015, as well as other pieces of tax legislation. Uh, know that there was calls for action around modifying um, basically the credit for electricity produced from renewable resources and the energy ITC credit the credit for production from advanced nuclear power facilities. Um, those were all at least called for to, to be modified, but fortunately in conference those modifications uh, were not accepted, and so they continue to stay in the statute as they are currently. 
Um, again, going to energy credits, there was actually a call for the credit for producing oil and gas from marginal wells underneath Section 45L, and the enhanced oil recovery credit under 43. Obviously, the oil and gas industry is alive and well. Those modifications were not accepted uh, in conference, so those stay uh, the same. So let's kind of move, in the time we have left, uh, more into uh, year-end planning. And what should we be thinking about now? And more importantly, what should we be thinking about as you go into the first quarter of 2018? Um, so Barry will talk later in the presentation around choice of entity. Um, what we would indicate as a firm is that basically every entity needs to now kind of step back and evaluate your structure given the corporate rates, given the pass-through rates, given all of the variables that are taken into consideration um, with respect to the pass-through entities and the individual rates. So um, we're um, recommending that every entity basically go through a business entity analysis modeling so that you are looking at all the variables and ultimately determining what is my effective tax rate when I really look at my, if I were to move to a C corporation, what do I look like from an S-Corp pass-through? What do I look like from a partnership? The rules are different, and then ultimately, um, how do we fall into that individual rate of 37%? So basically, the message we want to make sure is we're available to you. Uh, you're certainly able to reach out to me. Uh, all of our emails are at the, uh, the end of this presentation. But we would basically indicate, um, you know, stay prepared. Uh, there is a lot in this uh, bill, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, if that name holds. Um, we would tell you to begin to assess the impact of all of these provisions. We can help guide you through that. Um, ultimately, when you think about rate arbitrage, 35 to 21, or uh, going to the pass-through side, just the simple 39.6 to 37, there is certainly an opportunity um, to the extent possible to what we call manage revenue. And I'll get into very specific examples of that uh, in a few minutes. Obviously, a deduction today, being 2017, is going to be worth more than a deduction in 2018. So there's a number of automatic accounting method changes or um, other changes that you're going to look, look at from, you know, if you're a cash basis or accrual basis taxpayer. So ultimately, that kind of blends into just reviewing all accounting methods. And I'll give you some examples uh, as we kind of finish up. So focus on 2017 year-end planning considerations on the accounting method side and certainly on the credit side as some of these credits as well as the accounting method provisions have been uh, repealed. But first is, again, a rate arbitrage. Here's an opportunity from permanent tax savings. Obviously, with the rate reduction, it creates a permanent arbitrage between our current tax rates and the lower rates in 2018 or later years. So we're going to want to look at accelerating deductions for, for operating fixed assets. Remember that uh, the one provision in this, the uh, Tax Cuts Jobs Act um, that is retroactive is the 168K provision that we talked about. Uh, with respect to bonus depreciation. So for any assets placed in service after September 27th of 17 through the 1231-17, and again, immediate expensing if our class life's less than 20 years. So, you know, it's a very specific opportunity uh, to take advantage of those deductions prior uh, to, year, to year end. Um, you know, ultimately think about generating income to offset any prior year NOLs. Obviously, a net operating loss in 17 is worth a lot more than it will be, as Barry highlighted, the changes in the net operating losses. So remember that this is your last uh, year, if you will, to have a two-year carryback opportunity into 2015 and 16. So that goes through some year-end planning around where am I from a taxable income perspective, and what do I want to do to tip to capture taxes that I previously paid. Um, two other items around permanent savings is ultimately to create basis to claim suspended pass-through losses and then review your passive activities for maximizing uh, those, those allowed losses. Um, not necessarily permanent, but certainly something you want to begin uh, to look at in great detail. 
So here are some items that you need to begin to think about. We're not going to have a chance to go through all of them in detail, but I just highlighted them for you. And again, we're certainly available um, by email if you have any specific questions. So when you think about you know, some of the uh, acceleration and deferral techniques, you know, accrual method taxpayers that use a cash method for certain items, um, i.e., they're recognizing a deduction for an item when the payment is made, not when the item is fixed, the terminal and economic performance has occurred. You may be able to file an automatic accounting method change to deduct those items using the proper accrual method. So some examples of items that could be covered by this change include legal and other professional fees, warranties, and environmental remediation costs. Um, conduct inventory planning. Make sure that you are not capitalizing or overcapitalizing in the 263 cap A calculation. And then make sure if you're in a, uh, a LIFO, review your or elect LIFO sub-method. So to uh, basically um, control that from a, an inventory planning perspective. Uh, there's the recurring items um, uh, deduction out there, which you may want to utilize. Um, in accelerating deductions under what's referred to as the 12-month uh, the rule. Um, so look at that towards uh, year end. Um, accelerate like-kind exchanges so you're falling out of the change from only applicable to real property. Um, so in the event you're looking at that, I would accelerate those. Certainly you're going to be accelerating subsidiary stock losses. Barry will talk a little bit more about that. Um, if you've had a transaction, make sure you're reviewing those transaction costs. Make sure you're maximizing uh, the expenses. Uh, I mentioned around the deduction under the 12-month rule, your recurring items exception. And so make sure you're looking hard at that uh, with respect to an accounting method change. Remember, we're talking about automatic change. And then last, when you think about your IC disk, which Brian will talk about, uh, re being retained, uh, you know, we want to make sure you're maximizing under X61 uh, calculations uh, the IC disk deduction, uh, so you have that arbitrage as well in the 17 year. Um, we've already talked about the the 36 month, which is the three year rule. Um, remember that's now moving to the five year rule around if you were to elect uh, or take a current deduction for your cost of self developed software. Um, here's an item that I would tell you to look at heavily is in deferring income from advanced payments uh, with respect to uh, goods and services. Um, so when you think about that, taxpayers that receive advanced payments related to certain goods, um, use of intellectual property, computer software, um, or a warranty contract recognize that uh, from a federal income tax perspective when they receive it. You may be able to defer that income recognition under a Rev Proc 2004-34, which actually got codified in the, uh, the bill uh, underneath one of the accounting method provisions that hasn't been talked about a lot. But be aware that that opportunity is, is out there for you. Um, so when you think about um, <coughs> uh, accelerating 481 adjustments uh, from an M&A transaction, um, Evaluate your employee bonus plans. And, and clearly, uh, Deb will talk about this uh, in the context of accrued compensation and being able to really evaluate um, the book tax difference and going back to your bonuses, your commissions, your vacations, your severance pay by ana analyzing that change in the balance from year to year um, and making sure that you're maximizing that deduction uh, from an accrued compensation perspective. Uh, Accelerate recovery of real property through cost segregation. Um, this is a standard planning opportunity, but when you think about an asset or a commercial building or a multi-residential building that, that uh, certainly uh, got placed in service this year, if you have September 28 forward type items, you're going to want to make sure that you uh, complete a cost segregation study in regards to the personal property so that you can go ahead and expense that underneath the one retroactive provision. Um, so those are some of the items around acceleration deferral to take into account. I would leave you with this. You know, again, the 100% expensing of assets which have been acquired and placed in service after September 27, 17. Obviously, part of this bill is to accelerate the economy, and they are uh, hoping that a number of decisions will be made to go ahead and accelerate that spend. 
take into consideration your Q4 investments to utilize that benefit. 179, we talked about the increase to uh, the million dollar annual expense and the phase out. Um, we don't know what states will be doing, but we just point out that many states likely to decouple, but some do not. Something to think about. Um, and then ultimately, remember that we had this animal called the tangible property regulation, uh, 263 little a. Um, remember those opportunities are still available. Um, there's de minimis expensing rules in regards to assets. Um, there's certainly in the, uh, the maintenance or the repair and maintenance area the ability to deduct. So some last items that you need to think about um, from a 2017 perspective. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague Brian Dill to talk to us about all of the changes from a uh, transition to a territorial system, very complex area of the law if, if we haven't given you enough complexity. So Brian? Thank you very much, Ron. I appreciate it. Well, everyone, I wanted to uh, extend a big thank you from Speaker Ryan, especially those that work in the tech sector, uh, because without the advent of a smartphone that could have 256 gig of memory and access to the cloud, we certainly would not be able to complete a tax return on a postcard. So in international tax, um, what we need to know is that there's over 150 pages of new international tax law in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, so it's a very hefty change. It's a rethink of where we've been previously. I'm going to divide this up into a couple of three sections. One, and the first section I think people is, what do you need to know for 2017? Because one of the big things is the international actually could affect some of you with regard to your 2017 uh, tax year. With regard to that, um, if you are investing in foreign corporations, and those foreign corporations have deferred foreign earnings overseas right now, as you know, there's over a trillion dollars overseas. Um, and what happens there is there's going to be a tax in 2017 tax year uh, for those earnings that are invested in cash and cash equivalents at 15.5%, and for all others, it'll be taxed at 8%. So the big question is, who does that apply to, and uh, who is subject to that tax? Uh, we originally thought, and the big thinking has been for the last two years that have been running through the American Way uh, legislation, uh, we thought it was going to be limited to C corporations. However, in the final version and in the Senate version, it did not limit it to C version to C corporations. So it's any U.S. person who holds at least a 10% voting interest in a specified foreign corporation. And a specified foreign corporation is a couple of things. It's either a controlled foreign corporation, where that is people that hold a 10% interest, uh, U.S. persons. Um, they control that corporation, i.e. there's more than 50% ownership, or you have a 10% interest in a corporation and there's at least one 10% owner that's a domestic corp. Um, could apply to you, and you would need to pick up your pro rata share for the 2017 tax year of the foreign earnings, even though it's not distributed, and pay tax either at the 15.5% rate or at the 8% rate. There is, however, an opportunity to uh, pay it over an eight-year installment period. The thing is that it must be elected with your 2017 tax year. You must make that election in order to get the installment opportunity. As you can see on the slides, there's a real opportunity here because most of the installments are in the back end. In fact, 45% of the tax due on this transitional tax is due in the last two years. So there's a real opportunity, but it's important that you make the election, and it's important that you uh, know what your particular tax could be. Uh, please know, however, that uh, there are acceleration provisions that could apply and that you could accelerate the income tax on that into one particular year. One thing Congress did do is provide a deferral in this area for S-corporations. 
And in the 2017 year, what you can do is you are able to defer. You have to make a positive election if you're a, a, an S Corp shareholder. You have to make an election. And you can defer until there is a triggering event, what we call a triggering event. What is important to know, the triggering event is not disposition of the underlying foreign corporation, but it is disposition and transaction events related to the S corporation itself. So if the S corporation ceases to be an S corporation, like it converts to a C corporation, if it sells all of its assets or liquidates, or if you, the shareholder, actually transfer uh, the stock in the S corporation or a, a portion of your share of stock in the S corporation, then you could have a triggering event and be required to pick up the income tax uh, on this transition tax at the 15.5% on the cash and the 8%. Fortunately, even for the S corporations and the shareholders that make this election to defer, they also will have an opportunity to elect the installment election and pay it over eight um, installments. One thing to keep in mind, I think a lot of people out there thought that this opportunity for deferral should be extended to partnerships and individuals. And while we don't have a lot of insight at this point, I think if you look at the triggering events, it relates to the business being conducted in the U.S. through the S Corp. And so individuals, obviously, um, that are investing in foreign corporations, that was this uh, deferral was never going to apply to them. There's a question if it would be expanded to partnerships or certain areas of partnerships, but at this point, a week into it, uh, we haven't heard anything at this point that would extend this deferral to partnerships. So the bad news, 2017, you have a tax due, potentially you need to calculate it. What do you have to do right now? Well, you need to determine, number one, do you need in the next you know, uh, 10 days, if you have the opportunity, should you make a distribution, a dividend distribution from the foreign corporation? Because in calculating your taxes, you're allowed to take a foreign tax credit, even though it's a haircut, but you have to trigger the credit. And if there are withholding taxes on the dividends, the only way to trigger that is through an actual physical dividend. So I think a lot of people, a lot of my clients are looking at right now whether they should make a year-end distribution and trigger those withholding taxes so they can utilize those withholding taxes as a credit against this tax. And in order to calculate the tax, the second thing is we're going to be able to have to calculate foreign earnings and profits in these corporations. Um, it's a very specific accounting calculation. It is different than um, what you see on your foreign accounts from a statutory perspective. It's different than you'll look through your financial statements in a U.S. GAAP perspective. It has a lot of adjustment to it. So therefore, I would strongly say if you're going to have potentially a 2017 pickup of this and need to make a determination of what that tax should be, even if you're going to elect installment payments, you need to know what the EMP calculation is going to be and what that could be with regard to whether it's cash and cash equivalents or whether it is going to be um, uh, the other at the 8% tax rate. Also, for those that have C corporations that are invested in foreign corporations, please note that you're going to have to calculate your tax pools and determine your gross available credits uh, for purposes of the new, it's called Section 965. So there's a lot to do with this transition tax. It just came out, and there's a lot of year-end planning that has to be done, and then the ES payments have to be made immediately here, and then you've got your tax returns and elections that have to be made by the time of the filing of the return without extensions. So a lot to be done here right before year-end if this could apply to you. What is the opportunity in this bill? Well, the big opportunity and what people have talked about is moving to a territorial regime. Big picture is going forward, C-Corps, if you're investing through C-Corps and have foreign operations, 
will be eligible to bring money back to the United States um, in a tax-free manner because they will be eligible for 100% dividends received deduction. So we're moving to be on board with what other countries are doing to be competitive. Um, but remember, this is only available to C-Corps. So S-Corps, um, partnerships, individuals that are making foreign investment structures, this DRD and this move to a territorial system does not apply to you and that you're still under the old system and uh, need to determine whether you might want to change your overall foreign investment structure to take advantage of this through a C Corp. And it, it may make sense. A couple of things is that what is being eliminated is the foreign tax credit on the DRDs. You will not be eligible for a DRD foreign tax credit. You must hold these for at least a year. And then there are certain complicated rules that I will not get into today about hybrid dividend disallowances. And that's where foreign countries are going to give them foreign companies a tax advantage, a deduction, and an ability to bring that back um, and get the DRD in the US. So no, they will not allow foreign countries to subsidize foreign corporations um, by having the benefit of the DRD. The other big area, so we've talked about the 2017 tax that you have to be concerned about. We've also talked about the opportunity for a DRD and moving to a territorial system only for C-Corps. Uh, the next big area, as you might expect, is going to be an intangible income. There's two components to intangible income um, that need to be considered. The first is going to be a disadvantage that will apply to all investors. Um, and then the second we'll talk about will be an advantage, but it will only be available to corporations. First thing is foreign intangible income. Uh, it's an easily migratable income. Um, Congress believed that there were abuses in this area. Certainly Treasury and the IRS um, have been fighting in this area. So there is a perception, and it may be backed up by reality, that certain companies are earning intangible-based income overseas by parking their intellectual property and earning it at an incredibly low rate. So what's happening here is that they're going to force you under the subpart F provisions, if you're earning intangible income at an extremely low rate, um, and there's a formula and a testing, you'll be required to pick that income up in the United States immediately and pay tax on that income, regardless of whether you're a partnership an individual or a C Corp, as long as that's being earned through a CFC structure. They do provide, however, um, a benefit for foreign intangible income for C Corps. And it is a reduction from the new 21% corporate tax rate. For those persons that are earning monies overseas in the form of foreign intangible income, there's an opportunity to reduce your tax rates even further from 21% in the C-Corp structure to 13 and a quarter, 13 and an eighth percent, or 10 and a half percent. And that's the total tax rate. So for example, if you are in Switzerland and earning income at, let's say, 8%, you would be able to bring that money back to the United States under that subpart F provision I just spoke about, and only pay a top-up tax in the U.S. at the 13 and an eighth or the 10 and a half percent. So there's a real opportunity here for people to think about moving their IP in the United States and an opportunity to earn that income in the United States and pay at a lower rate if they're going to exploit that income or that property offshore. 
Other international items, I know we're running really a, a little late today, so I'm going to go a little fast here going through this. And I know it doesn't apply to everybody, but I think these are some things just highlighted in that 150 pages, some things to take into account. Sale of foreign stock. Um, if you're going to be eligible for the DRD and be into a territorial um, opportunity, there is now a limitation on the ability to accelerate and take losses on the sale of foreign stock. And in fact, what, what this slide is saying is there's a big add back of the dividends received deduction. So for example, if you had an original basis of a, let's say, 50, and um, the, the selling price of that stock was 10, um, and you were going to take a loss, you would be forced to add back um, or reduce, however you want to look at it, the, um, the dividends received deduction that you'd taken out over time. So if all you had achieved in that $50 basis was to take out 40 of E&P, and that left you with a 10 fair market value, you would essentially wipe away the sale of foreign stock, the loss on that stock. And also with tiering and and CFCs that go down multiple tiers from grandparent, parent, and daughter structures, there is a limitation on the sale of those lower tier CFCs and the ability to realize those losses. Foreign asset transfers, I think the important thing to remember here is that um, the ability, if you are in branch structures, so you have foreign divisions or foreign branches, um, and you want to get into a foreign corporate structure uh, to take advantage of DRDs, uh, the, the, the exemption system now, you cannot essentially take losses on the conversion of those branches into foreign corporations. In addition, uh, you've always been able, up until the, this new bill, to incorporate your foreign branches and there was an active trader business exception that is also going away. So as we move to territorial um, systems, the ability to convert from branch or divisional structures into corporate structures or foreign corporate structures, the advantages of that conversion, a lot of those things are being taken off the table. One thing to keep in mind, and I already previously mentioned it, is there's a modification of the foreign tax credit system. What has always been known as the 902 or deemed paid credits, uh, those are taxes that are actually incurred by a foreign corporation. Those credits are no longer going to be available. And those going forward starting in 2018, uh, no one would be able to take a 902 or deemed paid credit on a go forward basis. One thing to keep in mind is for those that do operate, especially in branch structures, and have historically um, been able to take a credit um, in the U.S. Uh, for their foreign income um, from these branches, uh, is to remember that a lot of times the way you were able to do it was maximizing your foreign tax credit limitation by selling your property through those divisions overseas because of title property, uh, because of the title, would change overseas. That has changed, and you now have to do new calculations to determine the allocation and apportionment of that income that is manufactured in the U.S., the inventory property, and it's really where the production activities are. So for example, if you have a foreign distributor, but you're manufacturing that inventory property here in the United States, that will become U.S. sourced property for the most part and will not help you be able to take a foreign tax credit on your foreign sales. So that 50-50 or what we call the 863B rule, that has been wiped out and it is now sourced where the actual production activity is. We don't have the actual allocation and apportionment rules out, but people should be cognizant of it that that could be a big change to those that have operated historically through foreign distribution centers. One thing to keep in mind for those that are operating through the branch structure, just like I talked about foreign uh, branches and distributions, 
that is going to be its own single foreign tax credit basket going forward. So foreign branches will not be in a separate general limitation basket or category. They will be into their own basket, and that could further limit the ability to take foreign tax credits on your foreign branch activity. One big thing to keep in mind, and I think this is really important, um, the OECD um, and the U.S. and Treasury have, for the last five to six years, been after what we call base erosion, erosion of the tax base by taking deductions for payments made overseas. Uh, Treasury is serious about this. Congress had followed them. And um, what's going to happen is you're going to have to report payments to overseas, um, especially related parties. And there's new reporting requirements. And if you thought the $10,000 penalties were tough for the filing requirements for your stuff, um, but this one on the base erosion, they've increased the penalties on this provision and noncompliance up to $25,000. So for those who've had to go through the voluntary disclosure provisions and have had to worry about the $10,000 penalty sections, this one is even more serious. It's a big deal, especially for middle market companies um, having to pay it at $25,000 a piece. So it is a, a big deal. And, and to know that it could impact um, a lot of people that are making foreign payments. Other international items, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Uh, there's other limitations on income shifting through intangible property. Um, there's new rules on hybrid transactions and hybrid entities. So for those of you that set up a foreign entity and make a check the box election and want to treat it as branches, there are new rules there. Um, I'll skip down. There is an inflation adjustment to de minimis exception for subpart F income. So uh, just be on the lookout for that so a lot of people can take advantage of that. And then there's a whole new section on provisions related to possessions of the U.S. So the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, those kind of things, they have a whole set of new rules if you're operating in businesses through um, U.S. possessions. I get a lot of questions, what did not make it? In the original Senate bill, there was an elimination of the, the original House bill of the Section 956 investment in U.S. property. Uh, that has gone away. Uh, there's also uh, the IC disk was supposed to be eliminated. Uh, thanks to everybody that called in on that. That did not even make it into the second Senate bill, and it, is, it did make it. Uh, what was surprising was the permanent inclusion of the CFC look-through rule. Uh, that did not make it in. And the problem there is it's set to expire at the end of 2019, and I have a lot of clients that that could be a big deal. And one last thing, worldwide interest expense allocation and apportionment did not make it in, and that is not a big surprise. So that's a whirlwind for international tax and 150 pages of new tax law. Um, hopefully that gives you a flavor of what could be the big changes, and I'll turn it over to Deb and Comp and Benefits. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> and I want to rush through this fairly quickly because the uh, choice of entity that Barry's going to talk about after me is uh, pretty important. So let me just highlight a few things on each of these slides. <clears throat> they did disallow deductions for entertainment, uh, country club, amusement, company planes, all of that stuff. Um, you can no longer deduct amounts for entertaining clients, essentially, if it's a uh, an activity or a facility. In addition, they've disallowed food and beverage expenses in a company cafeteria. Uh, interestingly enough, they put that disallowance at 50% um, until 2025, and then it goes to 100%. So they're kind of easing taxpayers into that. Employee achievement awards can no longer be in cash or vacations or meals or lodging. All of that stuff is going to be non-deductible. And just like it's non-deductible, it's, uh, it's taxable to individuals if they get it. Now, the one thing that a lot of people worried about was educational assistance, qualified tuition reduction. Those rules are unchanged. Uh, moving expenses, as like we mentioned before, note that it does grandfather. We'll get our moving expense deduction back in 2026, assuming no tax law changes. For ACA, no individual mandate, but remember, there's still the employer mandate, employer shared responsibility payments 
And the individual mandate doesn't go away until after 2018, so beginning in 2019. Um, we have a tax credit for employers, and this one is a pretty big one. It's only good for 2018 and 19, but if you actually pay wages to an employee when they're on family and medical leave, and those wages you pay are at least 50% of their normal wages, uh, and you give at least two weeks to for full-time employees for family and medical leave, and proportionate amounts for your part-time employees. So you have to provide this benefit essentially for everybody at least two weeks. Then you're going to be able to get a tax credit of 12.5%. And to the extent that you pay wages in excess of 50% of their normal wages, then that tax credit is going to increase to 25%. So, um, and uh, unfortunately, they did exclude uh, wage payments that are mandated by state or local law from what's eligible for the credit. But clearly, they um, want employers to pay family and medical leave wages and are giving a tax credit to let that re continue. The uh, retirement plan changes are, are really um, not that important. The one planning idea I will talk to you about, which is not eliminated and which people should be doing, if you can contribute, if you contribute to a traditional IRA on a non-deductible basis, of course, because the income limits for traditional IRA deductions are so low, you can immediately convert that contribution to a traditional IRA into a Roth. What you're doing is avoiding the income limitations for Roth contributions. Now, what some people did was, they, the old pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. They converted, but then if the investment went down, so they paid when they converted the tax, it was included in income. If the investment went down, they wanted to reconvert it and get it back into a traditional IRA. That's the change that was made. You can't recharacterize or reconvert. Um, the other thing is deemed distributions of loans. Um, now people have a longer time to roll them over. This is a situation where somebody terminates and they have a loan. They don't pay the loan off, so the loan would be included in income unless it's rolled over. They need time to come up with the cash. So Congress has given you an extra um, at, up until the extended due date of your tax return in order to do that rollover contribution. Million dollar deduction is a big one for public companies, but note the fourth bullet down there. They've expanded the companies that are subject to this rule. So if you're an SEC reporting company, so it could be a large private C or S corp, you may be subject to this rule. Um, the biggest thing is the second bullet is performance-based compensation. Everybody paid their executives in corporate America with stock options. It was not subject to the million-dollar deduction limitation. Those amounts are now going to be subject to this million-dollar compensation deduction limitation. Um, the other third, the third bullet was a common planning idea. Take all your money after you have retired so you're no longer a covered employee. The rule now is once a covered employee after 2016, always a covered employee. Um, there are some favorable transition rules with respect to the bonus performance-based compensation, uh, but this will be effectively for people that are making more than a million dollars. The deduction is really going to be limited to the million dollars for these top five people. The other one is private equity compensation. This private company equity compensation, this is an interesting one because what they've said is if you're a private company and you give 80% of your employees options or restricted stock units, they don't have to pay the tax on that when you give it to them. In fact, it can be deferred for five years or when they become a CFO or CEO or 1% owner or when the stock is readily traded on these exchanges. This is really something to give private companies, uh, to give the employees of private companies the opportunity to share in the value of that company without having to pay cash up front for the taxes because often that private company stock isn't liquid. So it's really a liquidity. Um, how much it'll be used because you have to give stock to 80% of your employees is um, anybody's guess. 
Uh, Tax-exempt organizations, remember I said there were a lot of, comp prob a lot of uh, companies that would be subject essentially to a cap of a million dollars for compensation deductions for the CFO, CEO, and the three highest paid. Well, we weren't going to leave out tax exempts in those universities, those football coaches. So we have compensation in excess of a million dollars is going to be subject to an excise tax since, of course, the tax exempts and um, don't, the tax exempt organizations aren't impacted by the loss of deduction. In addition, for tax exempt organizations, if you pay severance pay to one of the high, five highest paid individuals, and again, once you've been one of the highest five paid, you stay that for life as long as it happened after 2016. Severance pay in excess of three times the base amount. For those of you who know anything about 280G, the base amount is five times your average wages, three times your average wages over the prior five years. So uh, if you have somebody that's, that is a relatively low paid employee of a tax exempt organization and gets more than three times what his average compensation has been over five years, as a severance pay or retirement pay, then we are, um, there's a 21% excise tax. And finally, uh, I'm going to skip over this. If you're in a disaster relief area, distributions from your IRAs and your plans are taxed very favorably. There was IRS guidance on this in any event. But the one I really want to get to is this planning opportunity. If, and Ron mentioned it a little bit, if you're an accrual basis taxpayer, you can accrue compensation at year end and pay it by March 15th of 2018. It's deducted in 2017. Taxable income to the individuals in 2018. Corporation gets the bigger deduction, big corporate deduction now. Individuals have smaller taxable income amounts later. The key here, and it's very important, you have to have an accruable expense. It has to be fixed and determinable. And that you can do by a board resolution or written notice to your employees. So tell your employees they're going to get a bonus next year in, a, in written, legally obligated form. You can deduct it in the prior years. Pay it by March 18th. And with that, I think I'm going to switch it over to Barry so we can find out about choice of entities. Thank you, Deb. So we've obviously heard a lot today about a lot of changes. So the question is, how do I take advantage of those changes? In some cases, it's modifying the way we do things, some of the, the benefits or, or loss of deductions. The biggest overall thing that needs to be looked at is what entity are we going to operate in? So currently, when we make this decision, you know, the first decision point generally is, do I want to operate as a pass-through with one level of tax, or a C corporation as two level of taxes? Most closely held corporation businesses are, are not C-Corps because we want to avoid that double level of tax. And then we have to make a decision between S-Corp and partnerships. And those rules won't change quite so much. It's the first decision point that may have uh, a big difference here. So why do we do that? As I pointed out, our top individual rate is 39.6%. Capital gains are taxed at 20%, so generally on an exit transaction, I get a very favorable rate. If I'm in a corporation, effectively my rate is 34%. Then when the cash comes out, it's 23.8%, which means my overall effective rate trying to get cash out of a C-Corp is 49%. Therefore, pass-throughs make a lot of sense. So what happens with tax reform? Things change. So what changed? Well, obviously, we now go from a 34% rate down to a 21% rate. The individual rates have dropped from 396 to 37%, and the le income level at which that 37% is taxed has been raised. The other thing is the pastors now have a potential 20% deduction on their income. So if you're in the top bracket and the pass-through and you get the 20%, that's an overall effective rate of 29.6%. So those factors alone means we should be examining our entity selection. So here sort of to lay this out a little better, so assuming we have a business income that distributes all of its cash, 
currently in a pass-through, that effective rate is 39.6 at the top bracket and 49.7, as we talked about. If, I ha if I'm eligible for the 20% deduction, well, then the pass-throughs is at 29.6, and the corporate rate is 39.8. That's assuming a 21% rate inside the company and a full 23.8% rate on the dividends. But if that pass-through is not eligible for the 20%, then all of a sudden it's 37% and 39.8%. Those numbers are a lot closer together. Now, these numbers don't impact, don't, don't have uh, state taxes in them, and they will have an impact, but this is to give you an overall sense of what we're trying to do. So that was if we distribute all of our cash. But a lot of times, the owners have to leave cash in the business to help grow the business. So if that's the case, right now, you'd still have 39.6. Corporation's 34. They're about the same. But obviously, now going forward, depending on whether you get the 20% deduction or not, leaving cash in the business becomes a lot cheaper in a C-Corp environment. So I'm only going to get hit with a 21% tax rate as opposed to almost 30 or 37 percent, which means there's a lot more cash available to help grow the business without uh, getting hit by income taxes. Again, this is without regard to the state taxes, which you would have to factor in as well. So but one of the things we need to remember is that the C-Corps still get the full benefit of state income taxes. As was previously mentioned, at the individual level, the individuals are losing the, the tax benefit, meaning the, the reduction of their state liability, by the deduction they would get. So they're having a higher effective rate. And then remember that double tax is still applicable, meaning if I'm going to pay tax inside the C-Corp, the net of that when it's distributed to the, the owners is also going to be subject to a second level of federal and state income tax. Now, the federal tax is, is generally the dividend rate, which is a reduced rate, but we still need to remember this as we go through our planning. So what do we need to think about with our entity selection after tax reforms? Well, would the, would the business be eligible for the pass-through deduction? Clearly, if I am, then a potential 20% rate reduction is very beneficial, and I may want to stay as a pass-through. However, as Sarah explained and went through the example, that's done on a on a owner by owner basis. So, if you have an active owner who that is their only business, they may be get the full benefit of the 20% deduction. If you've got a more passive investor who has multiple uh, investments, some generating income, some generating loss, then that may have a different impact to them. So how do you account for all that? The other thing, as we pointed out, is are the earnings going to be retained or distributed? If the earnings are going to be distributed on an annual basis or relatively short time period, you know, then a pass-through may make sense because we're not paying the second level of tax. But if I'm not going to make those distributions and I'm going to accumulate that over a period of time, maybe a C-Corp. Secondly, is maybe there's ways, there's planning opportunities to avoid that second level of tax. So if, I, if the stock's going to be held to debt, till death, a Section 1202 stock, meaning when I sell that type of stock, I, do, I don't have any tax on the sale, that will maybe help reduce that tax. And again, those will have impact on, on the decision of what type of entity. And then lastly, there are rules out there currently, personal holding company accumulated earnings tax, which help limit the accumulation of earnings inside a C-Corp. Right now, the accumulated earnings tax is not really that much of a factor. As people try to use some of these planning techniques, maybe it becomes more important and has a bigger impact. As we talked about 1202 stock, if, if I have a company that qualifies and I have a shareholder who has owned the stock and, and received it in a 
type of transaction that's permissible and they hold it for five years, when I sell that stock, I will not pay tax on any gain. That's a big benefit. So if I can accumulate value in, inside a, a corporation and then sell it without any tax, well, now I'm down to one level of tax at 21% as opposed to uh, tax at the individual rates. So it is a five-year hold, and it's all or nothing. If I sell on, at four years, 11 months, it's not a proportion. It's, I pay full tax. If I sell five years in a day and I can take the benefit of it, then I can eliminate the tax. Exit strategy. So when I sell at the end, how am I going to sell? Am I going to sell the equity, the stock of the, the, the entity, or am I going to sell assets? What are the pricing differences are of those? If I'm a buyer, I'm willing to pay a little bit more for assets because I get a write-off for those assets. And as Ron pointed out, there's a way that I can take a big deduction right now for some of the, the value of those assets associated with certain types of property that I acquire. So if I pay somebody you know, $10 million and I get an immediate write-off of a billion dollars, that's a different tax cost to me of paying $10 million and not getting any benefit of a write-off. So how do I price that difference? And if I do an asset sale instead of a C-Corp, it still costs me money to get that cash back outside. As Brian went through international operations, there's differences on how uh, the operations are taxed if you're a C-Corp versus a pass-through. So the question becomes, how do I deal with that? I see this still might have a benefit for pass-throughs, maybe not for, um, maybe not for the uh, C-Corps. What does that do to my overall effective rate? As we talked about earlier, patents and self-created assets, if all of a sudden those are going to be taxed at ordinary income at the individual level, well, that now puts me at a much higher effective tax rate on a deal as opposed to if I try to run it through a C-Corp. Maybe that makes difference. Again, all of these things need to be analyzed. Related entities. So do I have related entities, one where the operating business versus the real estate, given the limitations on the 20%, the business interest, those need to be looked at as to what impact those have on those, those operations. And will combining those or separating those, how will that overall change? The tax status of the owners, obviously, you know, that's where the, the cash is being paid out for most of these closely held businesses. So how are the, the dollars going into the owner's pocket? We really want the net highest number of dollars going into their pocket that we can get. And as you have different owners at different tax positions, you know, how does that impact the decision making you do at the entity level? So what about state income taxes? You know, choosing a C Corp, obviously we have two levels of tax, but individuals lose a portion of their benefit. Maybe it equals out depending on the state, depending on whether I'm operating in a multi-state environment or not. So compensation, as Deb talked about. So if I have a C Corp, then I have to pay, then I can only pay reasonable compensation, and that compensation is subject to payroll taxes. Those W-2s have an impact on some of my limitations. Partnerships, that income is subject to SE tax, but since the partners are not receiving W-2 wages, again, that impacts my, my pass-through, my, my partnerships. With S Corps, I can pay my my shareholders' wages. It's subject to payroll tax. Any profit distributions are not subject to SE tax. So maybe after we make the decision as to whether I'm going to use an S corp or a part or a pass through or a C corp, then it becomes still a decision between partnership and S corp. Again, to figure out where the benefits from these new rules lie and how to best to exploit them. So what does that mean overall? There's just a lot more to consider. And we need to do it on a long-term basis. Not just what's happening this year, what not what's next year. What am I going to do over time? What do I expect the business to be? Where, where do I expect the exit costs? How am I going to get out of this business? How am I going to monetize it? Okay. Can I make the changes now? Can I do this in a tax-free manner? Or do I have to incur some tax to get into this favorable structure? And then 
impact of allowable accounting methods, as Ron talked about, the biggest one being cash method of accounting. If, if I'm currently a C Corp, I may be able to move back to cash method, which gives me a, maybe a better tax answer. So what are your next steps? Basically, we believe all existing any selections need to be reviewed. All existing related pass-throughs should be reviewed to determine if there's, there's the separate activities need to be combined. And you need to analyze the overall effective tax rates to figure out what changes you should make. Here's some problems in, in doing that. The individual provisions expire, assuming no future intervention by Congress. If they expire, what happens is the individual effective rate goes back to the 39.6. The corporate stays the same at 39.8. Those are almost equal. You, we need to be deliberate in the analysis. C corporations may look very attractive because of that low rate, but you need to consider all of the ramifications. Check the box selections, meaning I can change some of my entity selections in the first 75 days of 2018 and make it effective for the whole year. So while there's not a rush to do it before 1231, if you want to make this effective as of 1-1-2018, you do have a very limited uh, time period to start to make some of these uh, decisions. That's what you're, we're going to be looking like as we're trying to make these decisions on a go-forward basis. So this is a critical thing that I think every organization needs to, to deal with. Sarah, do you want to wrap up for us? That'd be great. Thank you all. Um, as usual, we've run right to the last minute trying to pack in as much information as possible. But uh, I do want to say thank you to your questions and comments that you provided. Uh, just to let you know a little bit ahead of time what we're planning for the new year. Uh, we have already scheduled a series of webinars coming up to spend more time on some of these particular areas starting on Tuesday, January 16th. We're calling it Tax Reform Tuesday, uh, but it's not all on a Tuesday. The international tax section will be on a Thursday here in January. Uh, this is our preliminary list. We are taking information from you to figure out what will be next. You'll see, uh, I think you already received a Say the Date. Announcement will have the information out for you to register for these webinars, those that are, are in, in, of interest to you uh, in the new year. But we want to hear back from you. The, the questions and comments you've submitted to us today in the chat are extremely helpful. We want to know the kinds of areas in this new tax law that are of interest to you, what's confusing, confusing where we need to spend some more time, uh, what you think is important. So your feedback to us will help us to focus those webinars in the future, focus our communications to you, and also let us know uh, how we need to uh, talk to you about those, uh, those items. Again, please reach out to us if you have questions. Um, all of our contact information is here. It's in the handouts. We're also uh, available on the firm's website. So please be, uh, feel free to reach out to us with specific questions. And we're going to take all the information you've submitted into the chat pod today uh, and create a frequently asked questions to go along with this information back out. So thank you all for your participation. We wish you a happy holiday. And, uh, and if we get the President to sign this, we will all be facing a new tax world in very short order. So thanks all today. Have a good weekend.